be here. Um, my, uh, my name is John Roden. I am the Senior Director for Bird Friendly Communities at the um, National Audubon Society. I'm based here in Los Angeles. And joining me today is my awesome friend and colleague, Tanya Romero, uh, from the Audubon Center at Debs Park. Uh, we'll be hearing from her really shortly. Uh, but uh, welcome and thank you all for joining this webinar on um, native plants here in California. Uh, it's a great time of year to be talking about native plants. Uh, the uh, Angelinos, Tanya and I are both in Los Angeles. So we're getting ready for some rain, which we're of course super excited about. Uh, and uh, it's a great time to be talking about native plants, like I said. So. I just wanted to kick off by um, talking a little bit about setting the frame a little bit about why native plants are important uh, for our birds. And then I'm gonna pass it over to uh, Tanya to talk a bit more about the specifics about the work that they do at the Audubon Center at Debs Park. And then we'll have lots of time for uh, questions from everybody. So you can use the chat for um, that. Uh, you can set it to all, to panelists and attendees so everyone can see your questions and we'll get to as many of them as we can during this hour. Uh, so again, just to set the frame, uh, I uh, oversee our bird-friendly communities conservation strategy, which works to provide food, shelter, safe passage, and places to raise young for the birds we share our communities with. And by making our communities better for bird, we also do make them better for people. So that's kind of a guiding principle of the, the team that I lead. And we understand that plants provide all of those things for birds and plants that aren't native can do things like provide resources for our birds. You think that, that you know, birds need things like nectar, they need seeds, they need berries and plants in general can provide those. However, native plants actually do a better job at providing a very critical resource to our bird species. And that is actually the way that they act as hosts for insects, particularly larvae of lepidopterans, butterflies and moths, which actually constitute a huge portion of the food that parent birds will feed their babies. Uh, and an interesting statistic is that about 96% of our land birds actually feed caterpillars to their chicks in the nest. And that's independent of what those birds eat as adults. And so they might be seed eaters, but they still rely on those caterpillars to feed their young. And the reason is, and I mean this with utmost respect, is that those caterpillars are kind of bags of fat and protein, which we know that young and developing organisms need to thrive. And the connection between those caterpillars and our native plants are that there's been a co-evolutionary process where our insects have evolved with those native plants and in some cases have very specific habitat needs and will lay their eggs only on particular types of plants. And so there is that close link between plant species and those um, caterpillars or the moss or butterflies that lay their eggs. It's not necessarily one-to-one, -one, but there's often quite a close relationship for those, for that part of the insect's life cycle. So, and there's a lot of data on this. I'm, I'm synopsizing a lot of research that's gone in by entomologists to understand this relationship, but we understand that relationship very clearly and that forms the basis of why we promote and we support the use of native plants to provide better habitat for the full life cycle of the birds that we are trying to um, protect, common and uncommon birds that we share our, um, our state with. So that's a really quick just intro and just I wanted again to give that framing. We obviously can drill into any questions you may have around that specificity or anything else. But um, with that, I just wanted to pass it over to Tanya and she'll um, talk a little bit more, more about the work at Devs Park. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Tanya Romero and I am currently the program coordinator at the Audubon Center at Devs Park. For folks that don't know where Audubon Center Debs Park is, it's located in Los Angeles, California, about five miles northeast from downtown LA. And here at Debs Park, it's a 284 acre park. And we actually have a native plant nursery um, on site. Now, usually I will take these native plant Q and A's from our native plant nursery, and I will be able to give you a quick tour. But unfortunately, because Los Angeles right now is getting some rain, um, I decided to kind of just stay indoors for a little bit, just in case um, I, I were to get caught in the rain. Um, 
A little bit about the work once again that we do on site is we do we have a current a native plant nursery on site specifically to be able to provide habitat enhancement and restoration for Debs Park, but also community parks throughout the Northeast Los Angeles area. Um, with that said, we go through the whole process of restoration, which means that we seed collect, we propagate, um, we bump up or transplant, and eventually we do out planning throughout these parks. So any questions that you have about that process in regards to also native plants, cuttings, or anything on that end, um, we're always also welcome to answer. Um, with that said, without further ado, I would like to open um, the forum for questions. So with that said, if you have any questions, feel free to go ahead and, and put them in the chat box. I know that there's a couple that have already been asked that we can go ahead and get started with. And um, John and I will go ahead and piggyback off of each other to be able to answer to the best of our ability. So I think one of our first questions that we have, John, is, um, hi, I'm interested in learning more about native plants for small containers, um, roughly about nine inches in Los Angeles. I'm interested in creating a garden for pollinators, specifically hummingbirds. So I can go ahead and get started on that one, actually. Uh, some of the really good native plants specifically for the Los Angeles area that will do well in small containers are going to be California fuchsia. Um, that's actually a very good hummingbird plant as well. I will tell you that um, it is going to go dormant, so don't expect a full embodied like green lush all year round. However, during the height in the summer, you will get these really pretty fuchsia colored tube like flowers that hummingbirds love. So that works really well in containers along with also milkweed, narrow leaf milkweed specifically um, will do well. The same thing as the fuchsia, it will go dormant. So it's just something to be mindful of. Common yarrow is another one as well. Common yarrow is kind of a bush-like ev evergreen shrub. And during spring, it will go get tall white flowers. And that will work really well in containers. And last but not least, I have sticky monkey flower. And sticky monkey flower will get these nice tube-like yellow flowers. So all, all these four species are very flowery plants that will look well and they also are adapted to one another. So you can, you can plant multiple of them within the same container. I don't know, John, if you want to add anything to that. It was pretty thorough. <laughs> yeah, that was, no, that's it. That was a great, um, a great list, Tanya. I, I would say, and I appreciate the question because one of the things that we try to emphasize in our programming is that uh, you don't need a large space necessarily to contribute to the to the native plants in your area, right? You don't need, necessarily need a yard. If you have a small place and you can have a container that will put um, plants in, that can have a real benefit. And there are data that indicate that insects will find those plants, that the birds then will benefit from them. So I just want to reinforce that. Thank you for asking about containers because that's a, a great opportunity. Uh, I would agree with all of the plants that, that Tanya shared. Um, I think one other thing that I was thinking, Dudleya, we have some Dudleya um, here, uh, which last time we did this, when I was able to be outside, I showed that, which does really well in a container and produces flowers that hummingbirds will take advantage of. And I feel like that we've, we've used um, uh, some of the sage, some of the salvia, mm -hmm. they do, I, I think that they may do better um, in when they have more. Um, and I would get your perspective on this, Tanya, but we have had some success in containers for some of the smaller salvias as well. So those are the only one, other ones that I was thinking about. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, I, I, I will tell you they're very hit and miss sometimes in containers, but I think specifically for hummingbirds and native plants, I mean, California fuchsia is a great one. Sticky is a great one. Um, and I think those are real. And the only other thing I, I just remembered is any annual really would also do well. So you have your puppies, you have your facilias. Um, and so yeah, any annuals will also do well. So I think we'll go on to the next question, John. And it says, can California native plants be pruned? And if so, how and when is it best to do that without harm? Do you wanna start off with that one? I'm sure I can do that. Uh, I could start off. Yes, our native plants can be pruned. Um, 
you know, typically because our growing season tends to happen, you know, now we're really talking about when we get rains that plants will grow and then they'll, you know, typically flower and then produce seeds. So one of the things that, that uh, I like to encourage is for people to think about if they're able to leave all or some portion of their plants with the seed heads on them and with that kind of natural um, um, growth, because uh, birds will take advantage of those outside mm -hmm. of the growth season and those can be really beneficial. But thinking about all of that, it makes sense to do pruning after they've gone through their growth and, and flowering and fruiting period. And so you could actually, before the rain sets in again, so we're not in that time of year right now, it would be earlier in the fall when you would wanna do that. But again, thinking about leaving um, resources available for the um, for some birds is something that I would encourage people to do as well. I agree. Um, and normally we do all of our pruning early fall as well um, for the same reasons. Uh, in regards of, of to like uh, where to do them, you always want to be mindful of nodes because normally wherever a node is on the plant um, can actually help it grow better um, during that growth period with the rain. So it's always also important to be able to prune wherever nodes are available just above uh, the node. Cool. And I think the next one we have is, I'm looking for bird pollinator plants that will survive on the Pacific coast in the S SF Bay area. It's very windy, salty, and foggy. And I think this actually may be a perfect time, John, for you to talk a little bit about the native plant database. Yeah, thanks, Tanya. Um, so this one thing I did not mention at the um, when I was doing it overall framing is that one of the tools that um, Audubon has developed is a native plant database. And so what that will um, allow you to do is it's a zip code based search tool that you put your zip code in um, and it will tell you what plants are native to your local area what bird species they could support with the resources they provide directly or indirectly, and then also what local resources you can tap into to support you. So if there's a local Audubon that will um, has uh, native plant expertise and resources can share with you. There's also a list of retailers uh, that carry native plants um, within 100 miles. It's a search radius that we put on there, uh, as well as other potential organizations that could be respond, um, be helpful. So here in California, we have a fantastic resource, the California Native Plant Society, which has um, both a state uh, organization and local chapters too. So all of that will be listed based on a zip code search. So what I would suggest if you're looking at the Bay Area in specific is to go to that. It's on housed on audubon.org and it's native plants. And you can then put your zip code in and, and find out what um, mm -hmm. plants would be native to your area. Now, it, it um, that's a first step, right? We all understand that there's a lot, it's, it's not just as simple as figuring out what plants are native. There's all kinds of other variables that come into play. So what I would suggest is that you use that as a launching point and you could then maybe connect with your local Audubon or other resources that could help you fine tune that so that it could really meet your needs where you are specifically. Where we're, so blessed in California to have such an incredible diversity of landscapes and native plants. But at the same time, what that means is that a lot of our plants are very highly adapted to particular um, types of uh, either soil or water or all of the above regimes, you know, kind of atmospheric moisture presence and those sorts of things. So um, we, it's, again, we're blessed with that ability here in California, but it, it does take some work to actually understand all of um, what, what needs to be brought to bear to make the plant successful. For sure, thanks for sharing, John. And yeah, just like John mentioned, that Audubon native plant website, it's a very, very good start. And then the other place I would also recommend is uh, Calflora, that once you become a little more familiar with that database and know what's you know, uh, locally specific, to your area. Um, Calflora is another like very thorough um, plant, the native plant database that you can um, go ahead and really drill in in regards to like, oh, what kind of soil do you have? What is the pH level? What kind of conditions are you looking at? Shade, no shade. So then that's also um, uh, a very good site. 
Cool. Now it seems like we have another question as far as this, the, we have an individual that has already planted native plants in the garden, but now they're looking at providing nesting facilities for birds. And does Audubon have any resources about what kind of shelter and for what species of birds should I provide? I think that's a very thorough and loaded question. <laughs> so I can take that. Um, we actually do, um, Audubon has produced a, a birdhouse book, which I actually have on my bookshelf over here, which goes into, so, so just to drill down into the question a little bit, um, when birds are constructing nests, they have, there's a whole variety of approaches to that, right? Some have open cup nests, some kind of don't do much nests at all, like morning doves, and some um, nest in cavities. And we have a birdhouse book which actually digs into all the specifics about uh, what types of uh, nest boxes can and should be constructed for um, different types of birds. I can, um, I think that I can probably dig up that link and send that, but um, that, that's a great resource that we have organizationally, which shares, it has plans for how to construct those nest boxes, et cetera. So that would be my first kind of reaction to that question. I don't know what your thoughts you might have, Tanya. Yeah, I will say that if you are planting native plants, you are providing nesting facilities and you are providing a natural nesting facility. Um, and, I think that that's already like a huge step, you know? Um, and of course there's definitely, you know, nest builders and boxes, but you also wanna be mindful of how many of those are you also bringing into the garden? Um, because normally if you have the right native plant infrastructure, the, the birds are doing it on their own. Cool, so we're gonna go on to the next uh, question. Do we have issues with vandalism on newly planted sites? I will tell you for Dev's part, yes, because we have to think about we specifically, our site is in an urban neighborhood, an urban environment. I think whenever we talk about urban environments, right? I always tell people, well, we're also gonna have um, urban problems or urban issues because of high traffic areas, you know, because of um, undesigned trails and things like that. And I don't think people mean to really vandalize on purpose, uh, but specific in our urban environments, I think there's still a lack of awareness. However, I think specifically for our center, what's been really helpful is we do a lot of community engagement events with the general public to be able to bridge, right, this native plant knowledge and the process of restoration to the community so they can understand and also uh, mend the land with us. I don't know if you want to add anything there, John. Um, no, I think that it covers it. Yep. Yeah. Perfect. Um, next question. So is there a wrong kind of milkweed to plant in Southern California? Uh, I, so I, I can kick that one off there. Um, we do have native um, narrowleaf milkweed is one that um, Tanya pointed out. There are non-native milkweeds that, uh, that I would advise against obviously using. Um, tropical milkweed is one that um, may be available and I would um, avoid using that. Uh, and that is Asclepias. So Asclepias is the genus of, um, of milkweeds and that's Asclepias curasavica, I believe that that is tropical milkweed. And then um, African milkweed is Asclepias fruticosa. So I would avoid using those. At the top of my head, those are the those are two that I would think that you'd want to that you may be able to to access, but I would avoid avoid that. I don't know what other thoughts you might have on that. Tanya. No, no, I, I agree. I think it's spot on. Yeah, so definitely go for the narrow leaf milkweed specifically for Southern California. Um, that's super important for our monarch. Um, cool, next question. So it seems, do we know of any native plants for birds that deer won't eat? I will not have any information on that. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. I don't know if I would have any off the top of my head either um, for, for California. There's some parts of the, uh, the country that 
I think there's some deer resistant natives, but I, I don't know about any here actually either. Tanya. Yeah, I'm not here within California. No, um, I think that's that's definitely a question we'll eventually have to get back to. <laughs> Cool. Um, next question. So another question can we can reiterate real quick native plants that are good for containers. So once again, view California fuchsia is a good one. Um, sticky monkey flower milkweeds are good ones. Any annuals California poppies tend to be a really favorite among individuals. Um, even some salvias. So uh, some sages you can also go ahead and um, put in containers. All right, I think next question. So any advice on pests with native plants? On um, pests, P-E-S-T-S? -E oh, pests. Mm -hmm. um, well, there's a, many interesting ways to answer that question, <laughs> I suppose. I could kick off. Um, so one of the interesting things is when we talk about pests, we're talking presumably, I, I mean, it's, there's different ways to interpret that question, right? So if it's our native insects that are taking advantage of the fact that we have plants and are eating them. That is part of the natural life cycle. And that is actually our, our plants, as I talked about at the beginning, right, have co-evolved with these, the plants and insects have co-evolved together. And the plants are able to withstand a certain level of herbivory, right? They're, they're adapted to having those pests um, eat them. And so, on the one hand, I, I you know some level of your plant seeing that evidence on your plants that they're being eaten is not a problem. There could be infestations of um, plants that are of pests that may be more harmful or detrimental. Um, some of those insects may not be native, and that's a, that's kind of a different question. So I, I I think about that from both perspectives. Like it, when I look at the plants that I've put in my yard and I see that things are eating them, I'm like, oh, that's actually really great because it's providing food and habitat for our for insect species. Um, but I, I have, when we have had infestations of some non-native insects, we have used things like neem oil um, to, to try and get on top of that. Um, nothing that is, is going to compromise or, or introduce pesticides into the landscape at all, but things like that might be helpful. Those would be my thoughts on it, Tanya. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't have anything really to add on that. I think for, for us, because our, our idea is to be able to do habitat enhancement restoration instead of like a, a constantly, right, uh, a constantly like, you know, manicured uh, garden, right? Um, once we plant, we let it go. So we, we don't really manage a lot of our, our, our pests within our restoration sites. Yeah, pest is, pest is a, <laughs> can be a loaded term. Like what do we need? So that's why we have to have some specificity around it, yeah. For sure. Um, we'll go on to the next question. So this one's related to climate change and native plants. It says, summers are, hot, summers are hotter, winters are warm and then wet. Anything in particular that we should look for in natives with climate change? This is a great question, right? And, um, as we think about how climate change is impacting our, our wildlife, both our flora and our fauna, it's something that we have to consider um, thinking about. You may have seen, this audience may have seen Audubon's Survival by Degrees report, mm -hmm. which if you haven't, I highly recommend it. And I think we should follow up with a link to that. That um, allows you to um, visualize at a very local scale, what the impacts to the birds that, um, that currently exist, what, what um, different climate um, change scenarios, how that will impact them. So 1.5, 2, and 3 degrees of um, temperature increase this century. And what the, the, you know, kind of the takeaway is that two thirds of our bird species are at risk due to um, the impacts of climate change. And this is kind of a long way to get at the, the question, but um, thinking about, and part of the problem with that, right, is that birds' ranges may be changing and be altered by climate, but there may not be a, a concurrent change in things like the plant ranges 
that can support them or the insects or so it's it just gets very complicated and very challenging for those species but thinking about how our um, how our climate is changing how it does seem like we're entering a drier phase of California history right that will have impacts on um, plant ranges and and may cause some ranges some current existing ranges to not be as favorable to plants because of shifting um, temperatures, rainfall regime, drought, et cetera. Um, it's hard to predict exactly how that will change or where we should think about moving um, from a planting perspective, but I do think it's something to think about and to look, you know, perhaps as we've already talked about the, the databases that can provide information on that, but, you know, even looking at surrounding areas where those, um, the plants that are found there, it's, it's really something that, that I think that we will have to think carefully about as we move into this next 10 or 15 years on what the impacts will be, but they definitely will be impacts. Sure, and I think the other thing to note there is also phenology. It's like we have a, a, a natural cycle that our plants go through, right? They have a certain time where they see, they have a certain time where they, they grow, they have a certain time where they, they drop leaf matter that birds will use for nests or vice versa, right? And that will also be, be start shifting. And when things phenolog phenological wise don't match up, then that is also something else that affects, right? Our, our wildlife populations, including our birds. Yep. Um, cool, we'll go on to the next question. Any fast growing trees to grow for backyard privacy that birds will also like? Um, this is specifically, from Yuba County, which is north of Sacramento. Um, and then they put pine trees. Pine trees are not gonna grow fast. I'll tell you that. So if we're looking for a fast growing uh, tree, pine trees is not the answer. Um, what I would say is um, if we define trees right as, if, if we don't include bushes into the trees, then there's very few trees that are gonna grow really fast. So what the things that came straight to my mind as far as like uh, fast growing trees are these fast growing bushes such as like our toyons, our laurel sumac, our sugar bush. Um, these three are, are hardy plants, right? But they're not gonna grow super, super tall. They'll grow about eight to nine feet tall. Um, however, I do think that do, they do provide uh, privacy in most places will use them as some type of barrier, um, specific on out, outskirts or parks, right? Um, and they will also stay evergreen. So I don't know if you have any other thoughts, um, John. No, I was thinking along this, I'm, I'm not super familiar with the plants that are um, in that part of California, but I was thinking of similar, um, I, I was going the same direction you were. It's like, I would kind of, I'm not thinking so much about trees, I'm thinking about shrubs that can have kind of a larger um, aspect and can provide that shade and privacy, like Toyon, those sorts of things that you mentioned. I think um, I, would, I would gravitate toward those as well. And the, and the bonus is that all those produce some type of berry. So then they tend to be really good for uh, berry eating birds like our robins, right? Our mockingbirds, our bluebirds. Um, wax wings. Always a, oh, wax wings are always a favorite as well. So those are good. Um, any recommendations for low maintenance native plants for family that might not be able to garden often? I think that's a good one. Yeah, well, and I think that one of the um, aspects of native plants that we haven't necessarily been super explicit about is that they, by, by nature of the fact that they're adapted to our local conditions, they, um, once established, right, they don't need a lot of additional watering, they don't need a lot of, you know, they're adapted to, um, in general, again, the soils and the, um, the types of nutrients that are available, so they don't need a lot of actual extra nutrition, they don't need composting or feeding. In fact, I, I feel like sometimes an over-rich soil can be challenging for some of our native species because they don't necessarily um, need that. So to your question about um, 
what, um, like not wanting to garden. I mean, I do think that a number of our sage species, right? They're kind of set it and forget it kind of um, things that they'll just grow. Um, I know that in my garden, we have um, uh, coffee berry. I love coffee berry personally. And, um, and that's another one that produces berries that are really highly prized for birds. And that's, uh, we barely do anything with um, these. Our ceanothus as well. Um, grows quite well. That one, um, we do end up, depending on where it is sitting in the garden, we have one by our compost and it can sort of get, I think that it actually does benefit from that compost because it's growing more rapidly mm -hmm. than others. Um, that can be, um, so we do a little bit of trimming on that so it doesn't impinge on the neighbors there. Um, those would be some of my thoughts. Manzanita, we have manzanita as well, which um, um, doesn't require much out of anything. I don't know, those would be some of my thoughts. What do you think, Tanya? Well, I think it, it goes back to like, what does maintenance look like for you? And I think for mm -hmm. native plants it, in comparison to, you know, exotics or grass, it's always a lot more low maintenance. I will tell you, however, that native plants do tend to have specifically Southern California native plants tend to have this wild look. So um, where it can get time consuming would be how manicured or how, how much pruning you want to do um, to your garden as well. But um, the other thing that to, to take in consideration would be the dormant period. If you uh, don't like right seeing a dormant plant or a plant that pretty much looks dead half of the year, you know, then I would I would stick to evergreen evergreen uh, native plants, right? But I think in general, um, native plants and any any type, right, um, tend to be very low maintenance after that that one year. So if you can like haul it out for a year, you're gonna be looking at you know, not at least nine additional years of relative low maintenance. Yeah, and I I don't know if we talked about this last time, Tanya. One of the the things that somebody told me when I moved to California was um, the when you plant a, a native, the first year they sleep, the second year they creep, and the third year they, they leap. Um, I don't know if that's entirely true, but I, but the point being right that that um, it's you know initially when you put a plant in right it's it's getting established right and so I think that a lot of the energy that it's putting into the growth and being established is happening underground, right? It's putting those, that root system in place and everything. So you won't necessarily see, you know, a, a lot potentially initially, and then eventually it's established and it will grow. So I think that that's one thing I would add. And then, yeah, you're absolutely right, Tanya, that um, some of our natives can, and they're native, right? They look, they don't look as manicured as, as others. And that may, that should, that would potentially impact how people feel about them and their gardens and maintenance. Um, and I did see a note going through the, the chat box is kind of flying by. So, um, <laughs> but I did see uh, somebody note that you will still have to weed. And that is something that, um, so if, if people are anti-gardening, that's tough if you have a garden because <laughs> you will have to do some work in there. Um, and just having natives doesn't mean that it'll re relieve you of the need to weed in your of the weeds and it will take a while to get rid of, rid of the seed bank. Yeah. Well, cool. um, I think this is a good question. How can all flower plants be propagated by seed and do they need a dormant period of time before planting? So I will tell you that most, at least California native plants can be propagated by seed. There are some ex exceptions that like, it's just ridiculously hard to be able to, to grow them from, from seed. And a lot of that cenotes and manzanita are, are, are two uh, big ones for that. Um, however, I will say that most, you can propagate by seed. You can put them in a flat. Most will, will grow relatively quickly. Within the month, you will start seeing seedlings. Um, there are exceptions where some of these seeds do need to go, need to go through a process of, the, of stratification or dormancy, which just means that you know, you have to mimic the winter conditions, the natural winter conditions. So they do will need some type of refrigeration or moisture, or they will need to stay within the flat a longer period of time. And these do tend to be more of our evergreen shrubs. 
such as like our Toyon, um, our elderberry, our California wild rose. So there are some exceptions to that. Um, however, for most things, you should be able to, to do through seed. Most of our popular species, um, we propagate by seed. You wanna add anything to that one, John? I think so. No, I think that that covered it. I was just, as you were talking about seeds and I thought about the question, you know, one of the things that I, I've loved about some of our California natives is their ability to self-seed. So, you know, we, pl we planted California poppies and then they went, they flowered and then they went to seed and then sure enough, the California poppies are popping up and we have hookara, which have similarly self-seeded. And so, um, it's not to the point of the question, but I just think about there's just joy in actually mm -hmm. putting something in and then having it actually do its thing and, and self seed. So. Cool. Uh, the next ones are what native plants are good for erosion control on the steep bank? And we can also talk about what ground covers are California natives? So I can start with some erosion control. I know once again, Cal Flora will also, um, whatever like California native plants you're thinking of, right? If you go to Cal Flora, that is something that they also touch on, on like, is it good for erosion control? Um, off the top of my head, California fuchsia is a great one. Uh, mugwort is also a great one. And that's because they have an expansive rhizome system where it's not their roots don't go super, super deep. They tend to be spreaders. So then they will kind of spread out, right? So then that helps a lot with that uh, erosion. I will tell you that also salvias tend to be a pretty good one as well, or any chaparral sage scrub uh, tends to do really well on, on those steep, the, the steep areas. I see that you have a steep bank. So I'm also assuming you get water there. So you might also want to try some riparian riparian um, plants if if it collects some type of water. And with that might be mule fat um, that will hit, uh, help stabilize it. Once again, that mugwort and even elderberry might be helpful. You wanna tackle ground covers, uh, John? Sure, I can talk about some ground covers. I would be really interested in your perspectives on that too though, um, Tanya. Uh, I think the ground covers, and I, again, I'm thinking, I, I'm largely thinking of Southern California, um, the ground covers that we have, you know, things like blue-eyed grass, something that um, does really well here um, and is, you know, just kind of a beautiful uh, ground cover. I think that there's some, um, uh, some of the sages, um, I, I can be, you know, have that low ground covery type of aspect to them that I think um, are pretty effective. Um, there's some native sedums that um, that we have used in our yard that uh, that I think can be pretty um, can can do a really nice job of um, spreading and providing that sort of ground cover. Those would be some of my thoughts. What do you, what what else would you have to add to that? Yeah, I I think uh, I'm. I'm right there as well. I think specifically for sage, what the one I'm thinking about is hummingbird sage. Mm -hmm. Tend to be like spread out, um, specifically in like banky areas. I think it's a it's a good one. Um, hummingbird sage. There also is coyote uh, coyote brush. Now there is a tall coyote brush, and then there is a ground covering coyote brush. Um, and I know that rents really like I I that's normally where I see a lot of them on the ground cover cover coyote brush. The other one that comes to my mind, but you would want to be mindful of, especially if you have children or pets, is uh, the Terra Ridey or uh, Morning Glory, um, just because it can be toxic. But that's also a very nice uh, ground cover, and you do have these super nice, like, um, white flowers coming out, white bell-shaped bell flowers that you know, I always find fascinating. But once again, you want to be mindful because the, the flower specifically is toxic. Cool. I, well, I'll go on to the next question. So it says, how dense should plantings be? That's a very good question. And I think that's a question we often get. 
Um, the cool thing about native plants is that they tend to be very good share, sharer spaces. So um, normally they will interact very well under, under the ground, you know, among each other and things like that. I normally do, we do two processes. We do some, some restoration work where it's considered bunch plantings, where we will literally have about five native plants right in, in a bunched in, an, in a given area about you know 12 inches apart and they those do well because they coexist very well i wouldn't do more uh more closely than 12 inches to be honest right um and so i, I would say about 12 inches is is dense now the other type of restoration we do is we do have a more space out and we have them about um I want to say two to three feet uh, spread out, but we also will, will be mindful of the ground covers or the grasses. If we have grasses or ground covers that are going to be like fillers, then we will do a little bit more of the bunching, bunching method around those bigger plants as well. I hope that makes sense because I know it's it's a it's a little complicated. Honestly, it's it's very like I always tell people, try it out. You know, like try out a couple, of, you know, and different methods because also the type of habitat and the ground and amount of shade can also play a factor. Yeah, and I would just, uh, I totally agree with all of that. And I think that um, you may make mistakes along the way, right? I think that that's something that we did. We, when, when we moved here from New York City, we um, we put too many plants in because we were too excited, right? Kind of put them too too close together and everything, and not really thinking about that longer term perspective on it. So um, so it's it's not a it's not a straightforward just like this is this is the silver bullet, this is the answer. But I think there's things to consider, and like Tanya said, you know, thinking about. Um, one thing that was, I think, helpful for us is even just like spending a year and understanding the light regime and where the shade, you know, like during the winter when we're getting rain and there's no sunshine, how does that impact the plants? And, you know, how does that impact the spacing of them as well? So all of that, it's, it's there's, there's um, a lot to think about, I guess, is the bottom line. Sure. All right, next question says, I think this is a good one, and maybe you can talk talk about it, John, because I know this is actually something that happened to you. Um, can you mix native plants into the landscape with non-natives that mean more water, or would the roots of the natives suffer from too much water? Oh, that's interesting. That is an interesting question. So, um, yeah, speaking from personal experience, um, we definitely have a combination of native and non-native plants in, in our yard, and you know, left things like citrus trees up. Right, because we wanted to have that that ability. I I, I think that we've done it, it. It there hasn't been a detriment to either the native plants or the non-natives to having a mix there. And I think that um, that you know we we want to encourage people to use natives for all the reasons we've talked about. But also people have many reasons why they want to have plants in their local environment and in their yard or in whatever space they have, including things like having fruiting trees or having um, flowering uh, plants or trees that might bring them joy. And we all need joy in our lives these days. So I, I think that that's all great. And I would encourage that. As far as um, we basically have tailored our watering regime to the native plants. And so then so the non-native plants um, like our citrus trees have thrived in that environment. We, I don't think that, that they've um, had any uh, suffered at all from that. So if I'm hearing the question right, it's we've tailored our watering regime to the natives and they haven't then been actually negative impact. We don't, we don't really care. We don't water, we don't care for our non-native plants. We just let them do their thing and they do fine we're focused more on the natives. And I think that, that we have a thriving garden that has everything um, doing well in it. Yeah, I think that's a good answer because a lot of the non-natives will, are the reason why they're 
they're, uh, they can thrive within this environment is because they're better at taking resources. So they tend to just be, I, I would do the same cater to natives and then the non-natives usually will be okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I will say, so just to be specific, I live in Venice and so we have very sandy soil and we have actually fairly quick draining. And I think that that as well um, is, uh, it, it just works for the palate um, of both native plants and the few non-natives that we have. Cool. Um, I think, the, oh, this one's a fun question. Are there any native plants that can survive with very minimal light? Minimal light. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the one, I, I, I would be interested in, I'm always interested in your thoughts on it, but the ones, um, so we definitely, we have coffee berry that, that is in shadow um, or is in, particularly this time of year, is not getting a lot of sun, that, that does fine. Um, I think, I don't know, that, I'm gonna launch with that and I wanna hear what you have to say as well. <laughs> um, any really, anything that's really an understory plant is gonna do good. Um, specifically, for Southern California, oak or actually all of California, anything that's understory of oak, walnut, woodland um, thrives in shaded areas. So that would include hummingbird sage, that would include coffee berry, uh, cacalia cordifolia, or uh, heartleaf penstemon um, would do well. Um, sugar bush can also do very well in shade. Um, so can lemonade berry. Um, so yeah, any plants that's really understory. Uh, can do well with minimal light because they're under a tree canopy. Um, so then that usually tends to be their preferred habitat. Have you, how about hookara? Have you had good luck with hookara in shade or? Well, hookara? Yeah. I don't, I don't know if that rings a bell to me right now. Oh, okay. I mean, we, we have that in some of our shady areas and it seems to do fine as well. But I think to, just to your point, right? It's more of an understory plant. Yeah, and, and I mean, I think that that tends to be the general rule of thumb yeah. throughout throughout the yeah. the country. Yeah, I'm get, I'm seeing some hookra fans in the chat. <laughs> yes, for shade. Great. All right, cool. Um, any advice about dispersing native plant seeds in public areas? No, I, I, I would tell you why. So you know that. <laughs> Right, long term, that it is a very good intention thing. However, um, when we're looking at these, uh, the ecological perspective behind it, right, is that you can go ahead and be introducing a non locally adapted native seed. So, normally, wherever you're getting native seeds from, unfortunately, they don't tend to be, um, uh, they don't tend to come from your local area. They tend to come from normally er areas uh, that are farther within your region. So what, what, what that means is that when you're throwing native seed into these public areas, um, you can bring in a, a gene flow, right? And that can al alter the, the, the ecology within that given area. Now, the other thing about public lands as well is that technically that's also, um, uh altering right that habitat and that that's a big no-no and that's also like a big fine um which you know once again i know it's good intention but when it comes to a lot of the ecological factors um it can really be detrimental to the given area yeah totally totally endorse what what tanya said it's um while the motivation behind it may be um, right. Um, actually, it's it, it, those types of efforts, and I mean that it sort of is veering toward ecological restoration needs to be done very deliberately and done in um, with proper planning and, and with proper sourcing of what the seeds are. And um, so I would not, uh, I would not endorse that kind of activity. For sure. Oh, and um, next, what are some fire resistant natives and can we address urban interface using natives adjoining open space and the danger of wildland fires? Do you want to take that one? Sorry. Yeah. Um, 
That's a very loaded question because depending on plant community, um, specifically California native plant community, um, right, there's, there's plant communities that are super prone, right, and need that fire and, you know, um, they're just super prone to fire and they will just light up. And then there's, of course, the native plant communities that, you know, thrive off of there. I would say Oguanid Willand tends to be uh, a plant community that, you know, are semi-resistant to fires. And what that means is that, you know, um, normally when a fire goes through, through there, um, it will get rid of the understory, right? But the oaks and the walnuts will stay in place. Now, we have to be mindful that, you know, um, specifically with global warming, that that is not the current case right now. Like old walnut woodland habitat is getting deteriorated. So it goes back to like, you know, because of climate change, these the fire resistant natives plants are no longer really fire resistant. And I think that that's, that tends to be the major conflict right now, right? And it's, we don't have to go crazy far. Like in the Angeles forest over summer, I think, I don't know how many acres, you know, got destroyed, but it was a, quite a bit and it was mostly pine forest, which is not meant to be able to, to, to be exhausted or be consumed completely by fire to that extent. So I don't know how to answer, like, you know, if we have any, any real like fire resistant natives anymore, right? Um, it's, I don't know, I think, I don't know, do you have anything to share, John? Yeah, it's, I mean, it is an interesting question. And I think that, um, you know, evolutionarily speaking, fire was, um, was something that some of our um, native plants were ad adapted to periodic fire and others because of the nature of where they were found were not, right? And so I think that as, as Tanya's saying, you know, climate change is affecting um, all kind of aspects of it. Range, it's affecting uh, temperatures, it's affecting fire season, right? We have, didn't we have fire a couple weeks ago? We had that, those really warm temperatures in the Santa Ana winds. And so it's like unexpectedly January is still fire season now. But um, so yeah, so I think that, that uh, it's, it's kind of a difficult question because things are in flux a bit and it's not necessarily, um, it's not necessarily a black and white issue around around fire and fire resistance. Yeah, yeah and I think with that said, right, um, and someone mentioned redwoods and sequoias. I mean, those are known that they need fire to be able to sprout. But um, I will also say that, I mean, there's very few people that are putting redwoods and sequoias in their backyard. You know, like that tends to be a more natural process. So um, when, yeah. when at least I'm talking about these fire resistant natives, it tends to be like these plants that you know, we're looking for our backyards. Cool, and I think we are gonna be wrapping up in about five minutes. So maybe we can answer two last questions that I saw here. Um, are non-natives that bloom in winter helpful or harmful as a food source for birds? That's a good one. Yeah, so um, I, I, I can kick off on this. I, I mean, it gets back to, again, what I originally said is that um, Plants provide resources for our birds, and there can be. And you know, Tanya talked about phenology, and one of the things that we think about when we're providing, we're putting plants in the ground to support our bird species, is that they are providing resources throughout the year, and that, and through careful and deliberate curation of your plants, you can think about that. So I think that if non-native species are flowering and providing nectar. Um, during the winter that uh, I wouldn't say that they aren't benefiting birds. You can 100% think of native species that again, if you think about the phenology of the entirety of the year would be providing those resources. In addition, could also be supporting other things like those native insects that could help later in the year when those birds start breeding. And so it's kind of a double edged question, right? So on the one hand, yes, but on the other hand, I think you can do a better um, a better job with uh, with natives that actually will support more of the life cycle of the bird. That would be my perspective. Yeah, and I share the same thing. Okay, we'll squeeze this last question. When is a good time to plant? I will tell you now and anywhere 
really, this is like a, a general rule of thumb. Um, after your first, your first rainy day of the season, that's perfect to plant. Um, so for LA, right, that was until December 28th because <laughs> that was our first uh, rain day of the season. But I actually, you know, put in three hours of work today in the morning to put in as many plants as I possible so we can really benefit from this afternoon rain. So first rainy day of the season and we that and we will conclude there. Um, thanks so much, everyone, for joining us um, for our native plant Q&A. Like always, it's a pleasure to be able to share space with all of you. Um, right now, the Audubon Center at Des Park is currently closed to the public, but we hope that in the future we'll be able to reopen. And with that said, we would also, for anyone that's local within the, the area, we'd love to have you join us for one of our restoration events when the time has come and it's completely safe. Yes. Thanks everybody. Um, hopefully that you've um, you've learned a few things or thinking you know more enthusiastically about putting natives in the ground. Um, we certainly uh, support you in doing that. And thank you as always, Tanya, for being such a um, incredible resource and a joy to work with. So thanks. Likewise, John. And hopefully we will see if we can do more of these in the future. Yeah, sounds great. Everyone have a great day and enjoy this afternoon rain for folks that are in. Yes. <laughs> okay, bye everybody. <laughs>